In the previous lecture, we discussed taxes levied on imported goods by governments in the form of tariffs. Tariffs, as an openly undisguised financial trade regulating factor, historically claims a supremacy role compared to other types of trade regulating mechanisms. In this lecture, we will talk in more detail about other ways governments and producers may implement trade barriers. We will explore NTBs, non-tariff trade barriers. NTBs perform the function of complicating even more the existing terms and conditions of international free trade. The World Trade Organization, WTO, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, the biggest umbrella bureaucracy in the world, oversees implementation, administration, and operation of WTO multinational agreements and provides a forum for negotiating and settling trade disputes among countries. WTO performs two critical trade benefiting functions. First, to ensure coherence and transparency of trade policies conducted by individual countries. And second, to provide assistance to developing low-income countries to adjust to regulations through technical cooperation and training. Since inception, WTO has been dealing with NTB issues at an increasing rate. These comparatively newly created barriers tend to express a broad range of coverage, from domestic public safety and product disclosure conditions, like labeling, to the stringent limitations to free trade, such as import quotas, government subsidies for exported goods, and domestic content requirements for inbound goods. Within each country, NTBs are implemented to benefit the domestic producers. NTBs are not designed by a country to protect the producers of the neighbor's nation. But as we will see, the WTO tries to maintain a level playing field for all member countries as goods and services are traded across borders. China said it's not going to sit still if this uh, huge anti-dumping duty is placed on Chinese steel to the United States, more than 75 percent, apparently. So would you think this is the start of the trade war already between China and the U.S. during this administration? Well, the uh, decisions to impose steep anti-dumping uh, duties and uh, anti-subsidy duties uh, are unfortunate and clearly going to have negative consequences uh, for um, China-US trade uh, and, the, and the steel trade in particular. Um, as bad uh, these decisions are, I hope and pray this will not lead to a more generalized, a broad, uh, full-fledged um, trade war mm. uh, between US and China uh, because um, a full um, fledged the trade war between the two largest economies in the world, you know, will not only do considerable damage to each other, but also have a disastrous consequence uh, for the world economy at large. Sure. But think about it, Mr. Freeman. I mean, China, United States fight over something that is so insignificant. I mean, still, how much really Chinese export going to the United States accounting for a huge percent of the U.S. production or use of steels? And also tires, which is also a small percentage of the bilateral trade. Why the two countries would fought over such unmeaningful things? Is it worthwhile? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I think if you uh, approach it from a strictly economic point of view, um, it, it probably isn't worthwhile. I mean, even if someone is subsidizing their exports, um, if someone is going to uh, charge you less than they paid for it for, uh, in a transaction, you take it um, generally as a rational consumer. Uh, the problem with steel or tires or these uh, heavy industry manufacturing issues mm. is that there are political components to them in both countries. And so uh, politics uh, frequently intervenes in the, in the uh, you know, trade, over, trade policy over these issues. Well, even if there's policy, rather politics into the play. We have to 
examining a little bit whether these politics are really put on the right direction. Previous cases, for example, have proven that saving U.S. jobs through tax measures is quite expensive. In 2011, tariffs imposed on Chinese tire imports to protect the U.S. industry likely to save about 1,200 jobs. But that total cost to the American consumers from higher tire prices was roughly $1 billion dollars in the same year. Consumers pay at least $900,000 to save one job. Mr. Prout, is it a good deal? Now, for more on the economies of Malaysia and Southeast Asia, I'm joined by Song Wonsun, economics professor at California State University, Channel Islands. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Now, Malaysia's 2017 economic report and budget spanned several fields, including security, entrepreneurship, and even calling for more private investment and pro-business strategies. What do you think were the most important policies unveiled? Well, clearly, uh, economic growth, uh, including infrastructure, infrastructure investments and security, uh, those are some of the key issues. Uh, Unfortunately, because of a slow economic growth, uh, the revenues are not going up very rapidly. At the same time, the government is trying to uh, hold down budget deficits. So in these situations, it is uh, very difficult to allocate very large sums into a single area. But clearly, uh, the investments uh, in infrastructure and bridges and et cetera, that is a very key objective. And this is one of the ways to accelerate economic growth uh, of uh, Malaysia. Now, you mentioned some of those traditional growth drivers like exports of goods and services. And according to the World Bank, some of those are close to stalling. So what about other drivers like the digital economy? How central could they be to expanding Malaysia's growth? Uh, clearly, that's uh, very important. Uh, like uh, many other countries, uh, Malaysia is trying to wean away from its uh, traditional sources of exports, such as uh, uh, oil and then uh, uh, other uh, commodities, uh, and trying to emphasize uh, high tech, uh, because uh, the country does export quite a bit of uh, electronic, electric goods. As a result, uh, it does have a lot of uh, skills and know-how. So I think you know this is a very good way to promote economic growth in the future. But uh, it takes time, so you cannot do it in a hurry. So I doubt that this will really uh, turn the economy around and show a uh, very healthy economic growth in 2017 beyond what we expect. An absolute import quota may be described as a quantity limit imposed by a country on the amount of specific goods imported during a period of time, generally within a year. Once the quota is met, no further considerations of domestic market demands are made. The quota limit is set, met, and not contemplated further. <laughs> At least not until the next quota limit is set. To manage the absolute quota system, a government will issue import licenses to named and authorized domestic importers for specific allocation of imported goods. A global quota expands the absolute quota system slightly by setting a maximum amount of specific goods available for import, but it does not specify who can import the goods, or where the goods will come from. Literally, it is a first-in-time, first-in-line import arrangement. Accusations of favoritism, incoming shipment sabotage, and port handling delays often lead to commodity supply problems. To iron out the problems of global quota systems, another variant, called the selective quota system, establishes a set amount of total imports of a good to be allowed into the domestic market, specifying which countries are allowed to ship their goods to the USA and the quantity of those goods the foreign nation can supply. Like other quota systems, it requires domestic importers to work with foreign exporters. By the 1970s, Selective quotas were phased out of the U.S. marketplace in favor of tariffs. Seems that the quota became passé because they generated no tax revenue for the domestic government. In Chapter 4, we discussed how tariffs influence national welfare. Import quotas can have similar trade barrier effects as tariffs on the welfare of national economies. We need to understand the differences to trade between these two barriers, of tariffs and import quotas. Most of the terms used are practically the same. Here, I will introduce quota rents. 
as a new consideration. Let's take a look at internationally traded cheese, but specifically at the U.S. as a small nation consumer and the European Union as a large cheese provider, huh, on a global scale. Again, we start with supply and demand curves for the U.S. cheese market. Since the European Union cheese price is mostly unaffected by our puny demand for exquisite cheese brands, the EU supply will be shown as a perfectly elastic horizontal line. The free trade importation of EU cheese shows total consumption of 8 pounds at $2.50 per pound, of which the US supplies 1 pound and EU imports supply the rest. Now let's deploy an import quota to limit the amount of European Union cheese allowed into the US to only 3 pounds per year. Instead of imposing a tariff, which will cause an elevation of the cost supply curve by the tariff amount, the quota system will cause a shift to the right of the U.S. supply curve. This shift is analogous to an increase in production, mimicking excess supply to initiate a new intersection with the U.S. demand curve for cheese. A new intersection is found, bringing the cost of cheese to $5 per pound with £6 exchanged at this price. Since the quota limits European Union imports of cheese to £3, the balance of the total sold in the market is supplied by domestic companies, in this case also £3. The imposition of the quota lowered imports from £7 to £3 and changed the total US consumption from £8 to 6 while increasing the cost from $2.50 to $5 per pound. At the same time, it increased U.S. production from the free trade quantity of one pound to three. Recalling a country's welfare effects discussed from Chapter 4, we can put these trade restrictions into context. The quota on European cheese allowed to enter the U.S. markets caused the price in domestic market to increase from the free trade price of $2.50 to the quota price of $5. The area A shows the redistributive effect, area B shows the protective effect, and area D shows the consumption effect. Just as in the tariff examples, the deadweight loss of welfare to the economy is a combination of the protective effect and the consumption effect combined. The mid-graphic area C is the revenue effect. This response is created by the quota making consumers pay an additional $2.50 for each pound of cheese. The quota creates an artificial scarcity of the commodity inflating the price of cheese in the domestic market. This revenue effect is known as a windfall profit, and also called a quota rent. The quota rent is collected by the authorized importer who sells it in the protected market. Who is the importer? We will look into who the entity can be in the next section. U.S. Consumer Surplus Falls by areas A, B, C, and D mathematically totaling $17.50. Staying on the topic of import quotas placed on items entering the U.S., we may remind ourselves that markets determine the balance between quantities supplied and prices formed, a standard supply and demand exercise. Now consider how quota affects this balance. It reduces the quantity of imported goods supplied to the domestic markets within a given period of time, restricting price equilibrium solutions. As an obvious protectionist measure imposed by domestic governments, it creates a scarcity to a commodity's availability, resulting in a domestic market price increase as compared to world prices, thus limiting foreign competition, benefiting domestic producers, while decreasing the supply for domestic consumers. Think about who could financially benefit from such a situation. A producer of the commodity in the domestic market obtains an exclusive license to import an item, available in the open market through free trade, and responds by stifling that foreign supply's availability in the U.S. market. Benefiting through import manipulation, a license owner has the ability to buy goods at world prices and sell them domestically at artificially inflated prices, thus capturing windfall profits. This fact has been recognized and steps have been taken in the U.S. to moderate the negative effects. One moderating approach applied in the U.S. was to allocate import quotas to domestic producers of the commodity based on their historical share of the import market. 
that is, intended to prevent the award of monopoly power to an importing entity. A variation of this is to award import quotas based on a pro rata basis, a license to import amounts equal to a fraction of their demand of the total import quota. A twist on this approach, tried by governments, has been to auction the import rights for a quota controlled commodity to the highest bidder. If an open and competitive auction is awarded to the highest bidder, the windfall profits would essentially be erased for the winning bidder, and the auctioning government would collect it all. At this point, the quota would perform much as a tariff would, except this increases bidder costs with no financial compensation for their efforts. Although both tariffs and quotas place limits on how imports are regulated by an individual country, they affect the government and interested producers in different ways. As protectionist measures with seemingly alternative end goals, quotas limiting quantities available in a market, and tariffs adding cost to the price, they basically behave in a similar way, both working against domestic consumers. Due to the structure of tariff payments, governments benefit directly as tax collectors. Quota license holders have the potential to reap windfall profits as sector-based manufacturers or importers. If quota limits are auctioned, the government collecting the auction fees reaps the windfall profits directly. Abuses of the absolute quota system have been witnessed in many countries, including the USA after World War II. A domestic production company acquiring import quota licenses for the analogous product may exercise monopoly pricing power to drive the commodity's price in the domestic market higher than the existing world price, leaving domestic consumers pinched by the arrangement. Quotas are considered a more restrictive barrier to imports than tariffs. However, they are still used. And the reason is obvious. Quotas allow analysts to keep track of the amount of goods imported when creating supply curves for easier predictability of import trends. Technically, tariffs add costs to the domestic consumer without limiting the quantities imported, while quotas directly restrict availability of products in the market, simulating scarcity in supply and thus elevating prices. The WTO 1996 Uruguay Round Agreements on Agriculture banned absolute quotas because of the inescapable infractions against global welfare. Tariffs were officially preferred in place of quotas. A tariff rate quota, called a TRQ, is a two-level tariff charging one tariff on a limited volume of imports within the allowed quota and a higher tariff on all additional amounts of imported goods in excess of the quota. The upper volume tariff is often set so high that imports are not profitable beyond the limited volume. In such cases, the TRQ functions exactly like a quota but with a relief valve to reduce consumer surplus declines for expected levels of demand and capture increased tax revenues when demand increases. License on demand, allocation of tariff rate quotas, limits are globally the most common type of quota administration, making up about half of all systems in use currently. The license on demand method assigns import licenses based on the number of licenses requested. If the sum of all requests is greater than the quota, each firm receives a prorated license volume within each tier of the quota. When all license volumes are combined, the base level of the quota is filled at the basic tariff rate, and extra quantity import licenses are covered at the higher tariff amount. This is an alternative for governments to ration quota rents. The way in which a quota is administered can have a direct influence on both trade flows and the distribution of rents, and is, therefore, a highly political issue. As we look at some of the tariff rate quotas in the U.S., notice that not only do the tariff rates increase at the higher volumes of imports, but the type of tariff often changes from a specific tariff to an ad valorem tariff.
The U.S. Sugar Program uses price supports, domestic marketing allotments, and tariff rate quotas to regulate available sugar amounts to support U.S. sugar prices above the world market price. The program was initiated with the Agriculture and Food Act of 1981, the 1981 Farm Bill, and has been reauthorized in each subsequent Farm Act. An important aspect of the program is that it operates to the maximum extent possible at no cost to the federal government by avoiding loan forfeitures to USDA's Commodity Credit Corporation. An administrative challenge to the program appeared because of sugar imports from Mexico, which now enter the U.S. duty-free under the terms of the North American Free Trade Agreement. That puts the Farm Act provisions upside down, derailing the Act's initial intent. Due to the high domestic price for sugar, industries using it in their products, like candy makers, have opted for offshoring solutions. What was designed to protect U.S. farm jobs through an agricultural support program has resulted in the loss of secondary processing jobs in a different domestic sector and movement of business investments to other countries. An export quota is a restriction imposed on the amount of the number of goods or services that may be exported within a given period, usually with the intent of keeping prices of those goods or services low for domestic users. At the same time, a government or an industry can use these trade-restricting tools to limit producer supply to other countries as a means to capture higher prices globally artificially creating their deficit in global product markets. You will remember in Chapter 4, I mentioned the export tariff, levied and collected by a selling nation, was categorically prohibited by the U.S. Constitution in 1776. An export quota is slightly different. These are allowed, and usually implemented as a voluntary agreement by producers. They work in reverse of the import quotas with the profits from the export quota retained by the exporting country. We witness export quotas exercised by OPEC countries to control international oil prices. Globally, oil prices have become hugely inflated from 1998 through about 2011, inflated in real terms by a factor of roughly five. At the time, the strategy worked for OPEC, but maybe it worked too well. Climbing prices motivated other oil-rich non-OPEC countries to invest aggressively in high-cost methods of petroleum extraction, like the U.S. industries developing shale oil to convert the organic matter within a rock into synthetic oil and gas. At the rate of OPEC price acceleration, shale oil production became feasible in terms of operational costs. As other global economic conditions intensified and a global recession unfolded, OPEC decided to relax their export quota to endorse member countries' release of crude oil supplies. Their decision has put the brakes on high-cost oil exploration by other active oil-producing nations, including the USA. Henry Ford was the first in the world market to develop automobiles, create the assembly line process, and revolutionize entire generations. Automotive production spread through many countries, with Japan recently taking a leadership position to certain markets. During the Reagan administration, slipping global dominance by U.S. auto manufacturers became obvious, and a voluntary three-year export quota by Japan was sought. The quota was accepted by the Japanese manufacturers and the U.S. auto industry believed it would stabilize U.S. producer market share. Instead, the U.S. market responded favorably to Japanese exports of higher quality basic models, with higher fuel economy, ergonomic design features, and safety enhancements. Japanese companies established transplant factories in the U.S. with no labor unions and started production of Japanese cars made in the U.S.A. The voluntary quota by Japanese automakers avoided U.S. Congress tariff actions. 
In the end, U.S. consumers were the biggest losers, as we voluntarily paid more for automobiles, while the Japanese industry collected the windfall profits from the arrangement. About 44,000 American worker jobs were saved through this arrangement, but it was at the cost to U.S. consumers of over $100,000 per job. You can't throw a rock into a quiet pool without making a big splash. Domestic content requirements have long applied to U.S. federal government procurement, with the Buy American Act of 1933 as the centerpiece. In 1978, the U.S. Congress began to extend domestic content requirements to state and local projects deployed using federal funds. The ripple effect has seen these federal requirements translated to state, county, and city-level procurement terms, and policies interpreted as local manufacture, local presence, and even residency requirements. Quote, we will only contract with you as a consultant if you live in our county. End quote. Federally, these requirements structure a multi-tiered tariff system to allow tariff-free import of goods that meet or exceed a percent of U.S.-made component value. As the percent of U.S.-made value drops, the import tariff rate increases. The load on the final product price is inversely related to the comparative cost of the U.S.-made components in relation to the global free trade cost. Ultimately, the welfare loss is left to be shouldered by consumers. We look at a welfare effects example from Australian content requirements on automobiles sold in that country. Because Australia is a small nation in terms of its demand for automobiles, and Japan is a large nation supplier, the elastic supply curve is shown as a horizontal line. Free trade comes to 500 Toyotas, sold at $24,000 each. Now suppose Australia implements a domestic content requirement on Japanese production firms. Australia has no commercial automobile industry. Therefore, to comply, Japanese auto firms must open a transplant factory in Australia using domestic laborers and materials. Due to higher cost labor and materials, Australian crossbreed vehicles cost more than originally imported vehicles in the Australian market. When they arrive for sale, the crossbreed sells for 33000 where domestic demand welcomes it with a purchase level at 300 vehicles. This content requirement causes Australian consumer surplus to decrease by the area above the pre-trade regions on the graph A plus B for $3.6 million. Of this area, $900,000 is deadweight loss by consumers. Area A, taken alone, shows the cost to Australian consumers of $2.7 million for the privilege of buying a Toyota partially made in Australia. Area A represents a redistribution of welfare from Australian consumers to Australian resource owners. Throughout this lecture series, you may have noticed my occasional references to governments aiding domestic firms using alternative methods of promotion. Instead of levying a trade barrier such as a tariff tax or a quota limit on the competition, a subsidy can aid domestic businesses of choice without changing import policies or creating pathways for unintended beneficiaries. Subsidies come in the form of grants, tax breaks, subsidized loans, or preferential treatment to allocate office space, production facilities, or other cash equivalent benefits to the recipients. In all cases, subsidy programs give domestic recipients a cost advantage where their products reach the market. Obvious targets for this treatment are infant industries. You will remember from the previous lecture the case of the Infant Industry Protective Tariff intended to shelter new domestic industry from international competition. The protective tariff involves a redistribution of surplus effects from the domestic consumer to domestic government and infant industry, leading to a reduction in consumption and an increase in prices. 
The subsidy comes from the government to the recipient without a deadweight loss. No reduction of consumer surplus, no reduction in consumption, and no change in consumer prices. Welfare loss is absent when subsidies are applied, but producer surplus is equivalent to the entire subsidy amount. They can come as domestic production subsidies or export subsidies. A subsidy program does not come free of charge. They are paid for from the government's general fund or from windfall profits otherwise acquired by the domestic government. Taxpayers as a population pay for subsidies, which in our modern world have turned into powerful tools of market intervention. With time, Subsidies become deeply entrenched into economic structures of individual countries, artificially skewing the competitive equilibrium between supply and demand, either within a single country or international trade. Effects of so-called perverse subsidies that demonstrate effects significantly adverse are broad in scale, from economic to environmental, and ethical to religious, often becoming unpredictable in nature. As any protective economic measure, subsidies actively instilled by governments to the fabric of international economic sectors easily translate into other countries' economic challenges, especially less developed, worsening their positions, thus leading to political tensions. An export subsidy quickly becomes messy as domestic producers are paid to export their less expensive domestic products into the world market where prices are higher. The local nation pays the domestic producer an export subsidy for each unit shipped overseas. Agricultural subsidies can be quantified as the most pernicious in character and mode of application. In Figure 5.4b, Supply and Demand Curves for U.S. Wheat finds an autarky price at $4 and volume at 6 million bushels. We will assume the U.S. is a small producer of wheat, so the global supply curve is a perfectly elastic horizontal line, showing price at $5 per bushel. At this level, U.S. producers would ship 8 million bushels, with half going domestic and half international. Now the U.S. government steps in to provide an export tariff of $1 per bushel for wheat shipped offshore. This shifts the world price upward to identify an intersection at $6 for 2 million bushels produced for the domestic market and 8 million more internationally, for a total of 10 million bushels. This arrangement creates a decrease in consumer surplus and an increase to producer surplus. The consumer surplus decreases by the area of A and B for a cost of $3 million. All of the consumer surplus plus the area C is transferred to producer surplus, totaling $9 million. The deadweight loss of welfare to the U.S. economy is shown in the area D at $1 million, plus the area B, a loss of consumer surplus, for a combined total of $2 million. The textbook does not answer the question I now pose to you. Why would the U.S. government, or any government, deploy a program such as this, as it does not directly benefit the people who pay for it? Find out what the linkages are and develop arguments for and against the export tariff for wheat. You may need to give this question extra time and research to find a convincing answer. Here's a little insight. There is one. International product dumping happens when a domestic producer delivers a commodity to an international market at prices below what is charged to domestic buyers. It also includes a producer who delivers to foreign markets their product below their marginal cost of production, for that producer specifically and for all producers. Again, I ask you, why would anyone do that?
For the answer to that question, we look at specific examples of dumping in domestic and international markets. The first example is sporadic dumping, happening when a producer ends a production cycle with more end product than anticipated, and the costs of storage are so prohibitive that disposal of the product on the international market at below cost rates is preferred. This might be an apple farmer who experiences a bumper crop generating so much excess supply that release of it into the domestic market may exceed their marketing capacity, and controlled atmosphere storage space may be limited. Many farmers may share the bumper crop experience. The farmer dumps a portion of harvest on international markets at below market prices to reduce the cost of product disposal while capturing some of their marginal costs. A different spin on this dumping scenario is predatory dumping, sometimes confused with sporadic dumping. This form of dumping is exercised by a large international producer who views entrance to their market as competition they can drive out of business, and in so doing, establish or maintain monopoly power. Although the tactic seems plausible, it is only a theoretical possibility on the global level, as actual examples have not been documented. In local markets, predatory dumping examples have been used to drive out competition in specific trades, which is made possible due to limiting market size and high costs of entry. Persistent dumping, as the name implies, is a form of dumping carried out on a regular basis. This form of international price discrimination enables a firm to establish different market prices based on the elasticity of demand in each market separately, not just on straight marginal cost considerations. Korean firm POSCO has been named the world's top steelmaker for the fifth year in a row. Now, among 36 global steelmakers surveyed, information service provider World Steel Dynamics gave POSCO the highest marks. The company's technological innovation, human resources management, and value-added rolled steel were pointed out as the core reasons for the number one ranking. Now, small U.S. steelmaker Nucor Corporation came in second in the survey, while Korea's Hyundai Steel cracked the top ten for the first time ever, ranking ninth. Our textbook gives a well-considered example of international price discrimination and persistent dumping for South Korean steel, selling their product both domestically and in the Canadian market. The South Korean domestic market demand curve is less elastic than the Canadian demand curve. We combine the demand curves into the total market chart seen on the right side. To find a global optimum production solution, South Korean steel will produce where the marginal cost equals marginal revenue. In the overall market scope, optimal production quantity equals 45 tons, with 20 shipped to Canada and 25 for domestic manufacturers. Average total cost at this production level equals $300 per ton. As a non-discriminating seller, South Korean steel would sell at the same price in both markets determined by the pooled demand curve at $500 per ton. Within each nation's demand at this price level, South Korean buyers would purchase 35 tons and Canadian buyers 10 tons. As a price discriminating seller, facing separate markets with different elasticities of demand and barriers preventing inter-buyer resale of their goods, South Korean steel can exercise profitable, persistent dumping in the Canadian market. The firm can use the marginal cost of production intersection with the marginal revenue in each market to identify the production quantity and find the matching intersection with each market's demand curve. In this example, they produce 20 tons to ship to Canada at $400 per ton and 25 tons for the domestic market at $700 per ton. Net revenue and total profits are increased. I recommend you study this example and be able to reproduce the findings in similar settings. Dr. Carbaugh presents a strong case using marginal cost, marginal revenue, average total cost, and mixes them with differentiated market elasticities of demand. Many times, case studies are presented to students with only supply and demand curves, where an intersection is relatively simple to find. 
The cost approach for analyzing the optimal point of production is more realistic in the real world. You will revisit cases like this once again. Be ready. As we consider product dumping in terms of trade between nations, we see examples of sound business management techniques, such as the South Korean steel example. We also see potential draconian attacks by producers seeking monopoly power in markets. And then we find examples within the entire range between the extremes. This is where most claims against unfair business practices involving trade disputes are found. The U.S. International Trade Commission, or ITC, was created with a statutory mandate to make determinations in proceedings involving imports claimed to injure a domestic industry or violate U.S. intellectual property rights. It provides independent tariff, trade, and competitiveness-related analysis and information. ITC duties are to verify if offshore firms are dumping goods within the U.S. market at less than fair value, or LTFV. I just talked about predatory dumping as a risk to domestic firms threatened by unfair competition and how it is sometimes difficult to distinguish between predatory dumping, sporadic dumping, persistent dumping, or sound business management decisions. When the ITC finds that violations are happening, or have happened, they determine the extent of the damage inflicted on U.S. producers and the differential between the U.S. market price and the foreign market price to find a margin of dumping. When unfair trading practices are determined to cause or threaten material injury to U.S. industry, the ITC levies anti-dumping duties, in addition to normal tariffs, on the infracting perpetrators. Generally, the ITC investigates price differentials between markets together with domestic producers to discover factors of cost, production, and other evidence to create a cost-based definition of production possibilities and delivered market price. These determinations include product manufacturing, packaging, shipping, and profit and loss factors. When the ITC and the U.S. Commerce Department find that dumping has occurred, a notice of violation is issued against the U.S. importer, not against the foreign exporter. The U.S. importer must immediately pay a special tariff on all imports in question. The U.S. Commerce Department considers the charges further and includes interviews with domestic producers as it investigates foreign market conditions. If the Commerce Department finds that no material damage has happened in the domestic markets, the special tariff penalties paid by the U.S. importer are returned. If findings of fact determine there has been dumping damage, a permanent tariff is imposed on future imports for that commodity, and the penalty tariff payment is retained by the government. In recent years, the average dumping tariff penalty for products delivered to the U.S. has been about 45%, with some penalties exceeding 100%. When imposed, the penalty tariffs cause foreign good quantities to fall by roughly 50 to 70 percent within the first three years following the findings of fault. Dr. Carbaugh has articulated a couple examples in the textbook to illustrate how Maytag faced foreign economic losses from dumping of Asian products in U.S. markets, and how our previous example of a bumper crop and Washington state apples were dumped in British Columbia, Canada. The case of dumping apples in Canada by U.S. producers was brought by Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development Canada. Their investigations were hampered by U.S. apple grower refusal to provide information for their investigations when requested. The findings result was evidence of injury to Canadian apple growers in the form of lost markets and below-cost sales. Washington apples sold in Canada were levied additional penalty tariffs for a five-year period. Are anti-dumping laws unfair? Well, I think it matters who you are and what your interests are to decide about the degree of fairness 
on these issues. I keep telling you to think like an economist, so I suggest this is a good place to start contemplating what your answer could be to this question. Supporters of this unfairness position suggest a level playing field argument to place U.S. producers squarely with international producers, or offshore producers equally with domestic producers. In the long run, it is said, a stable cadre of U.S. producers in all markets leads to economic stability and sustainable employment levels. Opponents of the unfairness position point out that the beneficiaries of dumped goods on U.S. markets are consumers who enjoy increased consumer welfare caused by the lower-cost goods. However, when the anti-dumping tariff is imposed, the shift in welfare moves from the consumer to the government in the form of a tariff tax collection. Continuing the think-like-an-economist trend, we can explore the current methods used to conduct market research as a primary means of seeking evidence. Government agencies, including the U.S. Trade Commission, uses an average total cost approach, plus profit, to determine fair market value. You may remember from microeconomics that average variable cost, plus profit, generates a fair market value better attuned to current market conditions. That is to say, once a firm has established its base of operations like offices, production facilities, commerce infrastructure, and land resources, these assets become part of the total cost of production. (laughs) They are sunk costs. When making the decision to continue production as markets swell or contract, only variable costs of production are considered. You cannot stop mid-year in production cycles to erase the costs incurred five years ago, or even yesterday. They are all sunk costs. Today's economic decisions are based on the variable costs of production. It answers the question, quote, will I continue to dedicate resources right now, end quote. This brings production decisions to a different light as sales prices are determined. Anti-dumping laws may punish firms that are simply performing consistently and profitably in competitive markets. Foreign critics of U.S. anti-dumping laws identify currency fluctuations as a cause of dumping evidence between nations. When South Korean firms export televisions to the U.S. for sale, their exports are domestically valued in won and converted to U.S. dollars by importers. Currency exchange rates change from day to day and within the time period that takes a delivery sent by ship to cross the Pacific Ocean and payment is collected. The cross-currency exchange rates may have changed by several percent. Under U.S. commerce definitions, the currency exchange difference may lead to evidence of dumping by the South Korean firms. If the charges are filed and the initial evidence looks convincing, the importer will be served with an anti-dumping penalty duty payable on receipt. Protectionist trade policies were widely implemented in the post-World War II era up until the end of the 20th century, mostly by developed countries. Until about 1990, the largest developed nations, like the U.S., were the primary petitioners of dumping charges against other nations, often weaker developing nations and undeveloped countries. Over the past 25 years, the number of petitions filed by developing nations has increased, and the U.S. has been named as the primary violator. We may be looking at retaliatory charges being filed by countries previously belittled by the developed nations, including the USA. Analysts keep rationalizing new trade theories that should concentrate on efficient allocation of resources on the global scale. The need for protectionist measures is justified by considerations of concerns for infant industries, allowing the assumption that those industries obviously lack competitive advantage. Wouldn't it be better if it moved its resources into an economic sector where it has comparative advantage, where no protectionist measures are required? Necessary ingredients for U.S. production are imported. 
These intermediate goods help create final products and typically account for more than half of the value of all imports into the United States. That means of all the stuff Americans buy from abroad, more than half goes into products that Americans make. When low prices of these imports squeeze the profits of domestic suppliers, foreign competitors are often accused of dumping their products in U.S. markets. Anti-dumping rules are supposed to protect domestic producers and domestic jobs from unscrupulous foreign competition. But access to these inputs at lower cost means lower prices for consumers. Anti-dumping rules raise prices for consumers and producers, shrink profits, and reduce the capacity of firms to invest, expand, and hire more workers. Consider Dow Corning. Dow Corning makes silicones, a crucial component of solar panels, and a crucial component of silicones is silicon metal. But because of anti-dumping duties that prevent cheap imports, Dow Corning has to pay double the world price for silicon metal, all in the name of protecting domestic producers. For some reason, U.S. anti-dumping rules prohibit administrators from considering the interests of downstream industries like Dow Corning, who would be most negatively affected by punitive trade rules. Dow Corning even tried to get its facilities in Kentucky declared a foreign trade zone so they could buy their inputs on the world market. That request was effectively denied. Consider also Spartan light metal products. A small Midwestern producer of engine parts, Spartan's biggest customers were looking to reduce the weight of their vehicles to improve fuel efficiency. So Spartan shifted from producing aluminum parts to products made from lighter, more durable magnesium. Spartan was doing well in the U.S. and exporting to other countries. But in February 2004, an anti-dumping petition against imports of magnesium from China and Russia was filed by the U.S. industry, which was comprised of just one producer, U.S. Magnesium Corporation of Utah. The price Spartan paid for magnesium more than tripled. Higher prices in the U.S. gave parts makers in Europe, China, and elsewhere a huge advantage. American suppliers went out of business. Downstream producers shed thousands of jobs five times more jobs than even exist in the entire domestic magnesium producing industry. Adding insult to injury, both magnesium and silicon metal are among the nine minerals targeted by the United States in a World Trade Organization complaint against Chinese raw material export restrictions. That's right, the official policy of the U.S. government is to oppose Chinese restrictions on silicon metal and magnesium exports while imposing its own anti-dumping restrictions on both raw materials from China. In the end, rules meant to protect American producers are actually nudging companies like Dow Corning to move operations offshore. That destroys jobs in the United States and makes the U.S. less attractive for investment. Since the Great Depression recovery period and two world wars, protectionist U.S. trade policies have used the Buy American theme to promote the government's procurement of goods and services as a means to promote the domestic economy. Tariffs were at historic highs in the U.S. across many domestic industries. The European economy was decimated after World War II, which allowed the U.S. to fill the vacuum with its exports. Traditional attitude towards tariffs started shifting in favor of benefits from developing international trade. With trade liberalization, more countries started to realize the gains from trade cooperation. U.S. trade policy has finally become an essential part of its foreign policy. Today, Buy American policies extend to detail the composition of goods as they are delivered under contract awards. Percent American content conditions are applied in context of the price differentials between domestic and foreign suppliers. Even if a low bidder is from a foreign country, or if a domestic bidder uses foreign sourced goods, the project would be awarded to the supplier using U.S. source goods, if the bid amount is within a comparative threshold range. The U.S. government is very open about its bidding criteria as compared to other nations. The U.S. invites companies from other nations to participate as it seeks the most competitive offers. 
Other nations are not as open about their goods and services contract offers. It is often difficult or impossible to be informed of requests for proposals from other nations as notifications of opportunities extend an assurance of consideration. Most other nations are not as transparent as to procurement criteria to potential bidders. What remains unwritten, or undisclosed, is often informally implemented by decision makers of contract awards. Your company may be the lowest bidder by 35% on a water systems development contract for the government of Brazil, but if it is not a Brazilian company, consideration will not be extended further. Governments react to the externalities of their policies and actions with additional actions targeting new desired outcomes. The textbook discusses a few examples I encourage you to explore. We will talk more about the CAFE standards addressing your automobile's fuel efficiency. First enacted by Congress in 1975, the purpose of the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards, or CAFE, was to reduce energy consumption by increasing the fuel economy of cars and light trucks. The Obama administration recently set standards to increase CAFE standard levels rapidly over the next several years, with the intent to improve our nation's energy security, save consumers money at the pump, and lessen our carbon footprint by reducing emissions from the nation's fleet of automobiles. Despite these lofty goals, the reality of the CAFE standard is that fleet fuel efficiencies have lagged well behind target levels ever since they were launched 40 years ago. Replacing existing inefficient vehicles takes time. CAFE standards do not change the economy of the vehicle in your garage. They target the car's replacement, but only if you buy a new car. Actual improvement in fleet average efficiency has not achieved CAFE standards due to technical and market issues. No one can fix the problem based in what they're going to do. It must be based on what has already happened. The Obama administration publicized 2025 fuel economy standards to increase fleet-wide average efficiency to 54.5 miles per gallon. While it is questionable if domestic manufacturers can deliver vehicles meeting this standard at a cost domestic consumers will pay, it is anticipated that violations of the efficiency standard will continue to incur gas guzzler tax penalties, to be joined by a much-anticipated national fuel tax. The end game is a shift of producer, importer, and consumer surplus to U.S. government via CAFE standard violation penalties. How does the federal government use those funds? Are they assisting U.S. automotive producers in the challenge to achieve this level of fuel efficiency without increasing highway fatalities triggered by lighter vehicles? Economic policies implemented within a large nation, like the United States, generally invoke secondary effects, and the use of the tax funds liberated is often overlooked. How do you think they should be used, based on the reason for their collection? This chapter considers policies other than tariffs, which restrict the volume of international trade. Such policies are known as non-tariff barriers to trade. The first non-tariff barrier we considered was the absolute import quota. A quota can be administered on a global basis or on a selective basis. Special attention was given to the revenue effect of an import quota, which may be captured by domestic importers, foreign exporters, or the domestic government. Also considered were tariff rate quotas and voluntary export quotas. The subsidization of domestic producers was another topic investigated in this chapter. Emphasis was placed on the differences between a subsidy granted to import competing producers and a subsidy granted to exporters. I noted that a subsidy granted to import competing producers results in a deadweight welfare loss to the economy, resulting in a protective effect, not a consumptive effect. We also discussed the nature of international dumping. The reasons for dumping were explained and also the impact of dumping on a firm's revenue and profit. Finally, I presented a couple of examples of social regulations implemented through industrial competition giving the case of cafe fuel efficiency requirements in automobiles and how that generates transfers of producer, importer, and consumer welfare to the U.S. government. But I still ask you, 
what is being done with those tax monies collected.